Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this week's seminar. Uh, today, we're really happy to have a seminar from Kiriaki Drumoni. Uh, before we begin, just a quick overview of the, the structure of the seminars. It will be around a 40 minute presentation. Uh, so please keep your mics muted during this time. Um, there'll be time for questions at the end, around 10 to 15 minutes. So please uh, just raise your hand to ask a question on video, or you can type your question in the chat on Zoom or YouTube, and we can ask it on your behalf. So this talk is being recorded and live streamed to YouTube, and you can watch it later on our YouTube channel. And also, just to mention, this is the final uh, seminar of the semester for this series but we'll be uh, restarting the seminar series next semester and the schedule will be updated soon. So thanks again for coming, Janine, who will introduce our speaker. Great, thanks very much, Caitlin. So I'm uh, delighted to introduce our speaker today, um, Sandy. So Sandy did her um, BSc in Geology and Geoenvironment and an MSc in Applied and Environmental Geology at the National and Kapustian um, University of Athens in Greece. She, in 2015, she then went um, to uh, Royal Holloway in London with a Reed Scholarship to do her, um, her PhD on volcano tectonics. And there she was um, com combining structural geology and um, igneous petrology, looking at Santorini volcano. And she basically is combining um, different uh, approaches, looking at numerical modeling and probabilistic modeling, looking at dike propagation and um, their tendency to erupt. So after her PhD, um, she then stayed on at Royal Holloway to do um, a teaching position in igneous petrology. And since 2021, she's been um, in Milan at the University Milano Bicocca, Bicocca, no, I can't say it properly, sorry, Sandy. <laughs> and um, she's uh, still working in volcano tectonics. So it's fantastic to introduce you to our seminar, Sandy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, very, very, very much for hosting me today. I would like to thank the League of World Sciences Research Group for this opportunity and mainly you and Caitlin for the invitation. Thank you very much because it fits, uh, science is a team effort and uh, feedback is the most important thing we can have from all of you, especially during these really upsetting times. So thank you very much for everything. Um, do you want me now to begin by sharing my screen? This is what is, okay. I'm going to do very fast. Okay, so as soon as I will be in full mode. One second. Okay, so to begin with, uh, uh, today I would like to uh, present some insights from field observation and American modeling, some aspects of what I did during my PhD at Robert Holloway and um, part of my welcome to Tony's PhD. And I can't begin without, first of all, uh, presenting my co-authors um, and my, my supervisors during this journey. So um, John Browning and Professor Alex Williamson uh, from Royal Away, uh, they were the people that I want to thank very much because they actually instilled me into this world of Vulcan tectonics. And uh, mo mostly they gave me the academic freedom to um, explore this world through my own eyes and through my previous backgrounds um, and learning so many more things uh, during uh, the, my, my studies at Royal Away. So, while I was working on the PhD project, where I had the opportunity to pose my own questions and try to look for the answers, I thought it would be interesting to go through this talk today and just go through uh, questions that can be posed in this field and how we can go closer to the, answer, to the answers that we are looking for. So to begin with, um, I will just briefly discuss a little bit about uh, the volcano tectonics uh, discipline and what it's all about, why we study uh, volcanoes and why it is important. And then I'm going to discuss a little bit before uh, the insights on numerical modeling on why uh, I decided to study Santorini volcano in particular. So uh, as you can see on the right side, you see the um, map, the geological map of Santorini. Uh, and on the left side, you can see kind of a chain. So this is kind of the 
pattern that we're going to follow today, a question that is going to lead us to another question until we find the light. So to begin with, volcano tectonics is a discipline that has emerged over the past four decades. And uh, we can see that uh, during the last two uh, years, uh, two great textbooks have defined uh, this discipline already, and this is important. So, uh, however, its roots are really, really older. So, vocabulary tectonics, if we could uh, describe it as a discipline, is the combination of three things techniques, uh, data, and ideas that they have all of them a specific target to understand the internal structure and processes that occur inside volcanoes at any scale. And what I mean by that, stresses, magma accumulation, and transportation of magma from the source to the surface. And all of those are relied to the most important and one of the most important, sorry, uh, targets in volcanology, which is the reliable eruption forecasting, which means that one day we hope we're going to define the frequency, the duration, the location, the size of the eruption in the time. Uh, another very important and particularly uh, interesting aspect of organ tectonics is that you can study and you can collect data and actively and fossilize deeply eroded uh, structures. So that gives you the opportunity, that gives us the opportunity to study uh, before, during, and after the eruption. So here, for example, I have these two really nice graphs which describe what volcanic tectonics is all about. From the left side, uh, from uh, uh, Valerius Volcano Park, we like very much this, uh, this, uh, this term, and the plumbing system, which actually is mainly focused on how magma is propagated from the source to the surface, from deep sea to reservoirs to the surface. And uh, studying volcanic tectonics it means that we have to be able to find areas around the world that they can provide us with these systems that can give us information about those, uh, how, how magma is transported to surface. So for example, <clears throat> in the picture here, I have um, a picture from the northern part of the Santorini, where we are going to discuss today, uh, which is actually part of the shallow um, plumbing system that we are able to observe and study here. So that's why open tectonics is kind of a really nice and novel uh, method to um, study volcanoes right now. Uh, before moving on, since we are going to present a little bit of uh, micro modeling here, I just wanted to go back to the classic uh, understanding of uh, volcanic tectonics which uh, relies to the combination of geology and physics and mechanics of eruptions. So um, we, my personal work was uh, focused on how magma is propagating to the surface through dikes, which are the, the structures that uh, can um, mostly on Earth, uh, do this uh, specific process. Um, however, the reason that we're standing in is because uh, the actual phase of the dikes uh, is, uh, is unknown. The dikes can either come to the surface uh, or they can stop on the way or they can reflect into the existing fractures or other structures and then they can change, deviate their ways to the surface. All those um, um, final destinations, if I would say that, are related to the mechanics and stress parameters that uh, uh, the elastic properties of the host rocks that uh, permeates you through. So the actual fate depends on the three, if I would say, related parameters, which are the tensile stress, which is generated at the type three, the rotation of the principal stresses, sigma one and sigma three, exactly at the type tip again, and the thickness of the elastic properties of the rocks above, below, and at the contact itself. So these uh, three parameters control this three very nice mechanism, the stress part, the elastic mismatch, and the foot forming, the boning, and the lamination. Uh, during my PhD, I work mainly in the stress fire. So the models that I'm going to present you are focused on how uh, stress rotation occurs at the tip of the dike and can de deviate or can tell us exactly if the dike is going to stop, deviate, or propagate the surface according to our model results. So the next question is why we're working on Santorini and why Santorini is a key study that we picked up. And the answer is, uh, has two options. First of all, um, it's profound that uh, according to studies, the volcanoes that uh, there are many volcanoes around the world that can be candidates to produce really uh, explosive eruptions in the future. So Santorini is one of it, but the, most, the second most important uh, uh, 
region is that Santorini experienced an unrest between 2011 and 2012, and that makes it a really nice candidate for Wolfram Economics, because during that time we had the opportunity to study uh, in situ um, what happened during the unrest. Unfortunately, there was no, uh, unfortunately, this is according to science, of course, there was no eruption, um, but we had the opportunity to study in situ the stresses, and we had a lot of uh, capacity of data from seismology and geophysics that provide us with many implications according to how that propagation is happening uh, is occurring in Santorini. So for those two reasons, Santorini volcano is a very nice uh, example, a nice candidate, because right now we have an area where it has uh, experienced an unrest and also it has a fossilized tax room at the northern Valley Wall. So before I go further into discussing about Santorini, very, very briefly, for the people that they have, they're not uh, particularly and um, haven't worked before in Greece, uh, I want to briefly say a little bit things and things about the geology and the geodynamics of, of, uh, of Greece and then Santorini in general. So Greece is uh, an Aegean microplate that we're going to focus and work on because this is where the volcanic art lies. It's located close to the subduction zone, and it's affected mainly by the Anatolian fault zones. Uh, and of course, it has uh, it has been has been influenced and it's being influenced by extensional regimes since Miocene due to uh, many active extension pulses that are happening here. So we can see very nicely in this map that map that is concentrated and surrounded uh, active structures in, in uh, Santorini. Uh, that there are many, uh, there is mainly a transtensional regime, you can say this is accommodated by strikes and zones and extensional structures, and of course the oblique subduction of the African plane. So we, we see here that Santorini is surrounded by a number of active structures that affect uh, at the same time and change the stresses around Santorini Island. And of course, this can, it's one of our questions was, is this can affect the tag propagation as well. So if we move on directly to uh, the geology of the area, we'll see some greenies here on our left uh, side. And in the square, we can see the northern part where the um, northern part of the wall dikes room lies. Here is the picture of it. You can see how nicely the dikes, even in 3D, they permeate into the host of, which is very heterogeneous and anisotropic. Uh, in general, Santorini has uh, experienced a number of eruptive cycles, uh, at least four of the collapse events, and the uh, difference between a number of clean and subclinian volcanic activity, as well as dike bed eruptions that produce lava seals and lava domes. The volcano in general hosts a two double, double magma chamber plumbing system, whose magma is a result of many processes from fracture, crystallization, mixing, and assimilation. Um, as you can see here, the dikes permit the heterogeneous host rock, and uh, you can see how easily they either propagate and segmented, or we can even find dike offsets, or uh, we can even describe uh, and understand what happened in terms of physical force processes of the host rock here. Um, if we focus a little bit more on the host rock, this is another uh, photo that shows, um, I tried a little bit to annotate the, the dikes in order to be more visible. And so you, you can see again how nicely in 3D, or we can see them in the field, and how nicely they are segmenting and they're propagating to the surface. Um, however, you can see how heterogeneous the host rock in Santorini is. Um, there are many different mythologies like tufts, bridges, or realic and lava flows. Uh, but most importantly, uh, we can observe a number of cross-cutting relationships between the dikes, which is really interesting from uh, our studies, for our studies, and the dike segments. All these are due to the decidual mechanical properties of the post rock, which we are going to uh, use and we're going to explain to, uh, soon. So um, another very important parameter that Santorini uh, make, makes it a very nice, very nice uh, uh, candidate for studying is that um, as we discussed before, dikes can arise, can properly deflect, or can propagate to the surface. Here in Santorini, we have both these scenarios in a short area of five kilometers. So here you can see an example of a very nice dike arrest, where a dike thins out and the dike becomes arrested on a contact with a steeper layer. 
In the middle photo, you can see a nice very nice wolf, and uh, which is quite distinct. You can see the offset, and also a pre existing diet that has already um, followed the as part of this pathway, the, the fold already, and a second diet is being deflected into it. Um, and here you can see on your right side the dikes that propagate to the, to the surface, either segmented or um, without the forming segment of the protein. So the first question that after the collection of all those uh, observations was, what is, what is happening with the dioxone? Is it local or regionally controlled? This is something that was a debate uh, previously as well. Many studies have been conducted and they were mostly talking about dikes, but they, they, uh, 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 they have been in place north in the direction north and southwest. However, um, this was something that we have to check. And since the old dike swarms are controlled by the local stress field, this is the knowledge that we get from studying dike propagation in other areas around uh, the world. And which in turn is partly the result of local features and regional features, but usually the only Field, field that uh, there's only one field at the time of the single dike placement. So here we went back to the field, we uh, mapped uh, the dike swarm, and we provided uh, as our first outcome the first um, a map which shows exactly the location, the strike, and deep of the dikes that we've seen on the northern part of the world. And We've conducted also a structural field based study in order to understand and study statistically the dikes observed in the Caldera world. So, here we collected data from 91 dike segments. You can see here in the rows diagram that the, the orientation is not, the strike is not consistent, so uh, it's mostly it's related to radio uh, uh, dikes. One, we can see at least four distinct dike populations that intensify into clusters. Uh, the classes are related to localities uh, across the Caldera world. And of course, we can see, as we saw again, different dive paths. And again, we observe in general how nicely some dikes that are very close to each other, one prefers to uh, get the rest and the other segmented close to the surface. So this was exactly the figure that brought the next question in our study. Like why those two dikes, they're so close to each other, they propagate and they actually are in place in the same host rock. However, they follow two different uh, propagation paths. But before we go into this, we also worked a little bit on the understanding what uh, and exploring the dikes and the folds as well on the area. So we mapped uh, the folds that we've observed on the northern border world, and we tried to focus and statistically to understand how many dikes are, are being um, deflected into these folds observed on the border world. Um, and at the same time, we used data from like the thickness of the dikes in order to calculate the overpressure that is needed for our numerical study. So I have here the two really uh, important figures that led us to our numerical models. From, in the, on the left side, you can see the rested tip where the dike is trying to follow the colonizer but fails. And this is a very nice example of a dike arrest, a dike that thins out of the tip. So that was what intrigued us to work on the dike of the scenarios. However, here we can see very nicely from very close that here is the fault in the dike fall interaction, how the fault uh, is most probably active during this uh, event, and the dike uh, interacted with it and followed its partly to this propagation pathway. So, for the first question, which relies on what is the probability of a dike feeding interaction, uh, we try to explore, as I saw before, the two dikes that we've seen very close by, the feeder. And the arrested one. So we worked on uh, two boundary conditions, either a magmatic overpressure only or magmatic overpressure and regional extension, because the, um, the stress field uh, at in the center of the the wall is, um, is extensional. So here you can see the setup of the fitted dike, and here you can see the setup of the arrested dike. What we managed to uh, replicate was the host rock geology, the stratigraphy, and the mechanical properties as, as closer as we could to the reality. Of course, um, 
And we design those models, adapts, and we perform models moving the type to the surface in order to see um, if we can have stress rotations, the distribution of the stresses ahead of the team, and any other implications that could provide the numerical modeling to us. So this is an example of DIKE 2. You can see very nicely that uh, we try to explore how the type is propagating the surface, and more importantly, with the, the amount of collected where and uh, how much the stress rotation occurred in specific layers. So we can see again that some of why the dike propagates the surface. Um, a pro a dike propagates parallel to sigma one, particular to sigma three. I have here kind of an example of what is a stress rotation according to our models. You can see that if sigma three is horizontal, then the dike propagates the surface. However, when it rotates and becomes orthogonal, then this becomes temporary stress spiral. So here we explore those key scenarios and we wrote down in which layers and uh, how often this stress virus could be performed and, or which were the parameters that controlled the formation of those temporary stress barriers when the diets propagate in specific setups. Uh, we worked on the specific boundary conditions, as I said, and we defined um, uh, the possible diet pathways. So um, in order to um, understand the process all over, because that was just an example from the field, we performed a number of sensitivity tests, which the, the parameters that were picked that are related to what we've seen in the field um, in order to make them realistic. So first we, ex we examined the layer sequence, so we change the sequence of the layers, many different uh, possibilities. The layer thickness, either of the lava or the scoria, Layers, the crustal thickness, we added more layers at, top of, at the bottom of the sensitivity. And loading conditions, we changed uh, the loading conditions, either only to perform on the overpressure or extra extension or compression. And there, here, sorry, you can see the results of the sensitivity test. Here, I provided a traffic light um, a map where you can see that according to specific um, in specific layers and mechanical properties, what was the possible pathway of the lava? Um, red for a possible rest, orange for an answer fate where their stress rotations were not 90 degrees, and uh, green for propagation. But even more, we tried to understand if there is a connection between uh, uh, the regional extension of stress received and the local stress effects. So if the magma chamber is really affecting the process is occurring at all. So now we've, we've worked a bit on you know, with the loading conditions. So we checked uh, many scenarios where overpressure and extension of compression of stress field um, were active at the same time and with different uh, amounts. Uh, so, for example, we, we tried an extension of stress field only or uh, an overpressure and extension, but with different uh, amounts of it. And then we explored again the same uh, possible pathways. Uh, it is very interesting to see that, in general, all key scenarios you can see, for example, here, where the overpressure is one megapascal and the compression um, extension, sorry, the compression is three megapascal. You can see that overall majority. Um, of the case studies provide an arrest, there is always one possibility that the opposite scenario will occur. So this is very interesting because this is why really that propagation is very difficult to be, uh, to be understood. On the next case study scenario, we worked on the dike fault interactions. As we see here, we simulated a fault zone first as a homogeneous one with the same mechanical properties at the core and at the and the second case study was we uh, modeled it as a heterogeneous one. So here you can see the different um, uh, properties uh, from the core to the rim. The dike fold was modeled uh, for a vertical dike and for an inclined state. So at the same time, we performed many sensitivity tests, as you see here, and we changed the dike fold angle, the thickness of the dike and the fold, and the effect of the tectonic loading again in order to explore what uh, occurred, what guided, what um, designated the path of this type and was deflected into the fold. So here we have 
we have this is an episode of the homogeneous and heterogeneous example. So if we would like to sum up, we will see that the models they have shown that type deflection is encouraged in those five, so four uh, case studies. If the fault core is soft, which means that it's active, then type deflection is encouraged. If the type fault is quite steep and the fault is core is relative steep in heterogeneous fault uh, zones, that's another. Um, these have shown also that dike deflection can occur. In the third case study, uh, when the fault core is thick and relatively steep, and on the fourth case study, uh, it's between the combination of the dike fault angle and the tensile strength of the fault core. Um, and here you can see also um, a little bit the schematic diagram of these uh, case studies. Here you can see that in terms of uh, homogeneous fault. Um, the dike can deflect into it when the, the fault is active. However, you can have, um, in, in case we have a heterogeneous fault, so a, an active fault again is, is, what, is what encouraging the dike deflection into it. On our last question during the finishing, uh, finishing uh, start stages of the PhD, was what are the limitations on the reconstruction of the Hokkaido plumbing system? And that's why, because uh, we worked on them, however, the more we know, the more we don't know. And so uh, deeper you go through this process, we realize there were many more limitations out there what we could uh, add into the systems. So that study, studying that propagation is always important. And uh, my next step here in Milan is to develop and understand how we can connect the deep seated uh, properties with the surface of deformation and of course, uh, and if there is a connection between these. So you see now that the chain that I used in the beginning of my talk now became answers. So the answers that we could took during the PhD, hopefully uh, during my work, they will, will, will guide us to understand what happens and what connects the depth with the surface. So my next spot is now working on Iceland. Um, I've been already there for 10 days. We're now in an ongoing study. Uh, we will try to understand and study end numbers of dike propagation in the surface related to glacial retreat and not. And we're, we're looking forward into designing new models, which are going to probably to give more insights on the dike arrest scenarios and the dike fault interactions that we have probably, uh, we have already worked so far. So the answers are out there. Um, that's, I think, the, the, the outcome of, uh, of this um, sort of uh, insight talk, because no matter how we ask, uh, we need to take more and more answers. And the answers are actually there. We have to dig them out in order to find them. Thank you very much for everything. That was really fantastic. Thank you very so much, Sandy. Oh, is my computer frozen? Everybody can hear me okay. Tell me if you can hear me okay. <laughs> Okay, everything froze for me. Yeah, that's right. um, something, and then I was sorry, but that's okay. Okay, I have you. I have you back. Perfect okay. now. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, we have some storms here, which are causing some technical problems, but yeah. so it was a really fantastic talk. So I was just wondering if anybody in the audience had um, any questions. We've got a few people on YouTube watching as well. So I I've, I've, can give them a bit of time to type questions if, if they have any. Um, oh, uh, Caitlin has a, a question. Go for it, Caitlin. Thanks for a really great talk, Sandy. I, I love the the nice pictures of the dikes and the the 3D like reconstruction. Like, looks really, it was like really nice to to visualize them in action. Do um, you use what numerical model you use and and what limitations that are in the model? Like, Sorry, you... I probably forgot to mention because I was going through. Uh, so we are working with quantum physics. Okay, so this uh, allows us to. Uh, model the dike with, uh, as a cavity, and we uh, give the dike in specific overpressure. Of course, when we design the domain, we we give the specific properties like the portions ratio, 
the stiffness, the young modulus of the dikes. Uh, and uh, we try to design and we to understand the distribution, as I said, of the stress field ahead of the dike tip and also um, the stress rotation that could designate the pathway. Um, we didn't go through uh, studying like the rheology or food environment is like that or um, others that would be fantastic to have inside or like say um, definitely analog models can, can give you very nice or Janine knows better than that on some other aspects that we didn't have the opportunity to work on. So I think that um, something that I probably forgot to mention is that the collaboration and the combination of different techniques, I think this is what is going to foster give us more answers onto those processes, definitely. Um, I hope I answered your question. I don't hear you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions from anybody? Um, I have lots of questions for you, Sandy, so I'll try not to uh, take over <laughs> too much. Um, but yeah, I guess um, as, um, as someone that's sort of combining um, field observation, like being very much driven by uh, field observations, I, I sort of, I wondered about those, um, uh, those they're really special outcrops aren't they in, in Santorini like to be able to see such great exposures and see the dikes having cut through so many different layers and things and that there's just yeah there's so many things that I want to ask about those but the maybe the first thing I want to ask is about whether you had um, a, a good idea in the field about how many of those dikes um, might have erupted and then how that sort of compared with your probabilistic models about whether you know you you have a different outcomes from your models saying the likelihood of an eruption and what that then looked like in the in reality somehow in the field is there any way of of testing your um probabilistic approach about what the frequency eruption should be <laughs> So I have a flooding of answers right now in my head. <laughs> right. So I'll try to give them this one because there are many different things that occur at the same time. So first of all, it's very difficult to find the dike fed um, observations in San Domini. Mm -hmm. We haven't found them in the Northern What We found on the Tirasia Island, but not on the Northern Dervo. So we can't make sure that those dikes have had definitely an eruption there. Of course, the dikes have fed the eruption because it's a dike fed. I mean, we can see the dikes on there, so we're talking about dike fed eruptions. Uh, another way to understand, uh, well, I go now to the part where you ask me if we can find out if something can feed an eruption or not. Is that the question? We can do well. So, for example, sometimes we can use some uh, field observations like the vesicularity of the dikes. Uh, if the, we can see vesicles, especially on the pores of them, then maybe this is uh, according to studies that have been done in other areas like Iceland around the world. Um, probably we can we can discuss, we can say that maybe this type could be a feeder. It's an indication that this can be a feeder. Um, however, Santorini, we also saw that some dives were carrying some uh, vesicles. Um, however, that's just an indication. Uh, since we can't see the dike fed observation, we can say that those dikes have fed them. Of course, they have fed some of them, but due to the multiple caldera collapse, it maybe those have been just destroyed, and we were just unlucky on observing the, the real uh, dike fed uh, observations. Mm. Yeah, it's it's always one of those challenges, isn't it? About the um, uh, you only get this sort of even though there's a bit of 3D information there, it's still just a 2D shot and it is just one part of the wall. So there's a lot of things we don't quite know, but yeah, that's really interesting. So Anthony has a, a question for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks Cindy for the talk. Um, what do you think the effect of um, like velocity of the dike coming to a rock, to, to the horse truck uh, could do? So like if you change the strain rate uh, on the horse truck, do you think it can change the, the patterns in your model? Yeah, well, I think I haven't, to be honest with you, I haven't tried that so far with the console. But uh, yes, I think it will, it will be uh, something that could be a uh, very nice idea to do in the future. But I, I'm not really working on this. I'm working on general model setups. Uh, but yeah, definitely I think that it could be a parameter, one of the many 
the grain size or any other parameters that I can have right now in my mind and the numbers really. But yes, thank you for the saying that. That's also a limitation regarding to the question that Caitlin asked before. Yeah, cool, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we, we also have um, a couple of questions on, on YouTube uh, for you. So um, great, someone saying um, a great talk, Sandy. Um, first question, um, how do you think that GASIC solution could affect your modeling results? Is GASIC solution something that you could possibly think about incorporating into, into the models at some point? Uh, yes, but again, uh, this relates to the, uh, like how much uh, um, bearing of uh, this vesicles, how many vesicles we can see in the dikes. The majority of the dikes are just a theory and they don't have uh, indication on those uh, information. Some, some of them, I've seen like uh, some, but not many. So you, you, we all know that we need to have a lot of data in order to go deeper into this aspect. But yes, definitely um, this can also be uh, a parameter that can be started in the system. Uh, unfortunately, as I said before, I haven't started so far. Mm -hmm. One thing at a time, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> and just four years. <laughs> okay, and so there's another question um, on YouTube, which is, um, do you think it could be eventually possible to use your modeling approaches and deformation data to better forecast the location of new monogenetic cones? I was thinking about La Palma. <laughs> okay. Um, I think this is the, um, the outcome of volcanic tectonics in general. This is why volcanic tectonics is a discipline that tries to, uh, this is related to the, what I began talking about. Yes, I hope that in the future we can collect all those data we have so far from fossilized and uh, uh, active volcanoes and we can combine our uh, disciplines and we can actually join our forces and have results into this. And this is actually what we uh, hope that uh, um, this that, that can happen really, really soon. I hope so. Uh, well, of course, we have so many things to model, as you see. But yes, um, why not? But at the same time, so difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so what's the time? Yeah, so we have a, a bit more time. So I have a, a, maybe just a, another question from me and if there's anybody else I've missed on the list. I think they're looking okay. So, um, so yeah, I guess another one last thing from me is is again about the the field observations, um, uh, and it's just because it's such a great opportunity to study those um, those dikes and in those different layers. Um, something which people have suggested is that as dikes are in place, there is basically like a damage zone um, of rock which is created ahead of the propagating tip. Um, and so like rock is, is fractured and then the magma intrudes and then perhaps that damage zone is somehow like left at the margins of the dike. And I wondered whether you had any um, evidence that that was happening in Santorini or whether instead these are very sharp margins um, to the dikes. So uh, in Santorini, the dikes are uh, in place on a very heterogeneous rock. So they are in place in different uh, layers. So what I mostly see is uh, some layers they can, we can see very nice that some parts of the dike um, chill margins. However, in other parts, because uh, the chill part the dike was in place and at the same time it was scoria layers and tough layers, you can see that uh, the tough and the scoria is attaching those chill margins. So they bury, they bury the, actually they carry the tough and the scoria with them to the surface. So it's very convoluted because Actually, as a dike was uh, propagating, it was carrying at this part due to the uh, temperature. The temperature was really high, so it was actually uh, uh, attaching them together. So the, this was moving towards the surface. So it's very, it's a complicated scenario. There, we can't see very clearly what we explained, but maybe uh, if we go and study areas that have different um, a host rock stratigraphy, so that could be the case. Study. But that's a nice, uh, uh, nice idea. Maybe I can go back and have a look at it as well. Maybe we can go together. <laughs> <laughs> um, Caitlin, you have a, a question? Yeah, um, I, did you see any evidence in the field of two dikes propagating at the same time? And have you investigated that with your model? 
Um, I've seen, maybe I can see you, I can see you again, this very nice dike that merges. So this maybe can be a sign that two dikes are propagating and then they are sharing their overpressures and then they can just uh, change again. Maybe I can come back to this slide. Yeah, here, can you, can you see these dikes here? Yeah. So they propagate the surface and they suddenly they merge and then they continue their set again, separate pathways. This is something very interesting that I would love to work <laughs> in the future. Uh, I think that this has happened at same synchronicity because otherwise this could have not occurred. Um, probably the dikes share their or same overpressure on the way to the surface and then they uh, split up again. Um, this is an evidence that maybe I realized to what you asked me. Um, I haven't studied so far, but that's something interesting that I would like to do definitely. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great, okay. So um, I think that's that's probably it then for our questions. Um, so I'll just um, finish off by saying thank you so much, Sandy, for a really fantastic talk, really inspiring. Great to see the models and the field evidence and how things are working together and to learn a little bit about what you're, you're doing and your, your new project as well. So thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you very much again, and I hope I gave you some insights on like uh, on the observations I did uh, during my PhD and the models that I performed. And uh, I hope that I will have the opportunity to show you many, many, many more in the future. Yes, thank you very much, and see you in person, of course. Yeah, to discuss them. Brilliant. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again.